All right, Matthew chapter number 15. Let's dig right into the passage there, starting in verse number 1. Look down in your Bibles. The Bible reads, Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. So we're going to start seeing this now, this interaction between these scribes and these Pharisees and Jesus Christ. And they're going to accuse him. Remember, before we saw they were already uh, trying to accuse the disciples. Why are they eating on the Sabbath day? Why are, you know, They're plucking these ears of corn. And they're always just looking out to just find something wrong and to condemn. And this is one of the things that the Pharisees have been known for throughout all of Jesus' ministry, and even prior to Jesus' ministry, right? Because it's not about what's, you know, like, like um, they don't understand the spirit of the law, and they don't even really understand the letter of the law. It's just about their own religion. It's about lifting themselves up, putting other people down to try to make themselves look better. This is the religion of the Pharisees. And um, we see that time and time again. So now their latest complaint is, well, how come they didn't wash their hands before they ate, right? Say, like, what are you, my mom? <laughs> and, uh, and Jesus has to explain, uh, you know, he ends up explaining that, ver you know, basically their, their tradition of washing their hands. He, he's gonna, we're going to see that in a minute, how that's not what matters anyways. That's not going to make you unclean. That's not going to defile you. But before he even goes in with the explanation of their tradition, he just counters what they're saying with, well, why do you, also says in verse 3, but he answers and said to them, why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? So, oh, you, you want to, you, wanna, you know, cling to your traditions. You want to hold tight to your man-made traditions and you want to condemn everyone else for not following your traditions. Well, how come your traditions are transgressing God's commandments? Why are you coming up with these stupid traditions that are in violation of God's commands and you're elevating your tradition above the word of God? And he gives an example of this in the next verse. Verse number four, he says, For God commanded saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. This is, these are commandments from the Old Testament. These are from the Word of God. Honor thy father and mother. It's part of the Ten Commandments. And he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. Yes, that is part of the Bible. Yes, when a, when a, a son would curse their parents, and we're not, and you know, we're not talking about some little kid getting angry and saying, "I don't love you, Dad," or whatever. When they're three, this is talking about a grown son cursing their parents. And you know what? God says that's wicked as hell. Okay, that is wicked, and that deserves the death penalty. And we need to have a proper understanding of of even you know something. Whatever God says is the death penalty ought to weigh very heavy on our minds and just, and just understand that is a grievous sin. Because right. God is the one who determines what's just. What is justice? What would be the right punishment that needs to be meted out for whatever the, the, the transgression of the law is? What is it that is going to make justice happen? Well, you can't get any higher of a crime than a capital crime, right? Than something that requires a person's life. Why am I spending even so much time on this? Because we live in a society where the kids are just mouth off to their parents. No respect is given whatsoever. And this whole concept of honoring your father and mother and whoever curses their father or mother, they deserve to be put to death. That's the way God sees things. I can't imagine how angry it must be making God when he sees these families and these kids are cursing out their parents. You know what a curse would be like saying to your parent, go to hell. Because that's a curse. Curse is the opposite of a blessing. What's a blessing? Hey, I want you to do good. Hey, I hope everything goes well. I hope you prosper. I hope your life goes well. I hope you, you have good health. Those are blessings. A cursing is the exact opposite. I hope you rot. I hope that everything bad happens to you. I hope you go to prison and you rot in that cell. That's cursing. And the Bible says, he that curseth father or mother. Jesus said this. 
You know, people want to say, oh, that's Old Testament. Jesus said, Jesus is condemning the Pharisees because they're not obeying the commandments of God. They're elevating their own traditions and completely ignoring what God's law says, and he's condemning them for it. And here's, and here's how. So in verse 5, he's going to give us the tradition of how they're just completely turning God's law on its head to basically be meaningless because their tradition uh, says this. So verse number 5, he says, But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. And honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Now, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time in this, but because I've done it before, I've done it in sermons in the past. That word honor is, is a misunderstood word today because people often just think of honor and valor and something that's just, you know, when, when you uh, show respect to somebody, that that's honor. And I'm not saying that that's not a valid definition of the word, but the way that honor is used in the Bible is more than just respect. There is respect that goes along with it. It's tied closely with the word. But honor is literally like caring for and even just like financially taking care of people. So in 1 Timothy chapter 5, when the Bible says, honor widows that are widows indeed, and uh, the, the elders that rule well, you know, that let them be worthy of double honor. It's not double respect. We're not just respecting widows. The whole point of honoring widows that are widows indeed is that you're taking care of them because they have no one to take care of them. Because they don't have family members, they don't have a husband, they don't have the children to take care of them, but they've lived godly, they're doing the right thing, they're going to church, they need to be helped. Someone needs to take care of them, and God said that that's the church's job, to honor them by care, taking care of their needs, making sure their needs are met. The elder, his needs ought to be met because he's living of the gospel, so he should be able to, to partake of that and, and be taken care of. And if someone's ruling well, then consider them worthy of double honor. And likewise here, when the Bible says honor your father and your mother, it's not just saying respect your father and your mother. It's you honor them and it's your duty to take care of your parents when they get older. When they need help, when they all of a sudden now have a need, it's your job. It's not, oh, just, and here's what they were doing. They were saying, just consider it a gift. No, you owe, and, th and this, this is a great illustration of what a gift is and what a gift isn't, right? Tie this in with salvation. We, we use this analogy all the time with salvation. Salvation is a free gift, right? If something is a gift, that's undeserved. That's unmerited. It's just, well, I love you and I want you to have this, so I'm showing you grace and I'm giving you this gift, this is the attitude they had with their parents. Well, whatever I end up doing for you, you just consider that a gift. And Jesus is saying, you owe them. The Bible says you owe them. You are, you are commanded to honor your father and your mother. It's not just some gift out of the goodness of your heart that if they're lucky, they'll help you out when you get older. No, they must take care of you and honor you as a child. I mean, it's only right. This is the way that God, God laws. If people were able to follow God's laws, everything would function perfectly. But of course, we're sinners and people break God's laws all the time. But if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. When you're brought into this world as a child, whose responsibility are you? Your parents' responsibility, right? They're supposed to work for you. They're supposed to provide for you. They're supposed to make sure all of your needs are met. So likewise, as you get older and as they get older, and now all of a sudden they need to be taken care of, they can't work anymore, they can't provide for themselves, it just makes sense that now you, you know, return the favor. The roles are reversed. The obligations now are, are switched. You need to take care of them. They took care of you when, from, you know, when you were born. Now you take care of them. And they came up with these traditions where they say, and I, it, yeah, it's not in this passage, but another one they call it Korban. Like they had a name for it. You just consider that Korban, which just means a gift. Well, however you profit, and, and notice too with that, the definition of honor, 
Because they say, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. Profiting is, is they're increased. They're, whatever it is that I give you, that, that increases you. That's the honor that he's talking about is being violated. And it makes, because the, the whole commandment of God now, their tradition allows them to just say, oh yeah, well, you just consider it a gift. What about God's commandments? Your stupid tradition now is just completely uh, just done away with God's commandments. Now, let's keep reading here because this is just one example of how they allowed their own traditions or their own beliefs to supersede the word of God. As in that has more importance and that has more weight Verse number seven says, Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So he's calling them a bunch of hypocrites. He's saying, You know what? Out of your mouth, you're saying things that sound good. You're saying things that sound like, Oh, we believe in Moses. We believe in the prophets. We believe in the Lord, right? They say these things out of their mouth. He says, but your heart's far from me. You sound like you're trying to get close to me with these words, but your heart couldn't be further away because your heart is full of hypocrisy because you don't really care about your parents. You don't really want to honor your mother and your father. You say these great swelling words that sound good to people, but you don't want to have anything to do with obeying the commandments of God. So you figure out a way to get around God's word and still look really religious. And they make their traditions. And they end up teaching doctrines, the commandments of men as doctrines, instead of just God's word. Now, before Jesus Christ was born, the physical children of Israel had a lot of false religion that influenced and paganized the true religion of the Lord, right? This is something that we see going on in Jesus' time. There's the Pharisees, the Sadducees, right? All of this is happening in this time frame. We see a lot of examples of it, but this isn't new to that time period. This is something that has been going on all throughout history. It was going on before Jesus came on the scene. It's been going on since after Jesus came on the scene. This has always been, you know, these infiltrators in God's true religion. And you could look back, look back through the Old Testament and you see how, how the children of Israel have been influenced by the, by the heathen people surrounding them and how they've brought in their idolatry and brought in their false gods and, and changed the way they do things and, and brought things into the temple and, and, and you know, added the high places, right? And they did all these various things and created different types of altars that were not commanded by God, but they started to paganize the real religion. Um, and it had gotten so bad, of course, that the children of Israel were taken into captivity, that God's judgment is, you know what? Your heart has... has finally gone just too far away with the idolatry. And the idolatry is, is kind of the key with all of it. It makes sense. You look at the first two commandments. God, sa you know, God says you should have no other God before me and you're not supposed to make any graven images unto yourself, bow down yourself, worship them. You know, those first few commandments, you look at that, God's serious about that. You look at how people become reprobate in Romans chapter 1. Well, they knew God. They glorify Him not as God, but it came vain in their imaginations, their foolish heart was darkened, and they worship and serve the creature more than the creator is blessed forever. Amen. That's idolatry. They're making up their own gods. They're worshiping and serving the, cre the, the creature. They get focused on idolatry to the point to where they hit the point of no return. Just as the children of Israel made it to the point of no return with all their idolatry as a whole, as a nation, well, God says, all right, judgment's coming. You're getting yanked out of the promised land. Likewise, individually, people, when they get caught up in this idolatry, can just go too far and they're done. And then all they have left to face is judgment. But when you would talk to the people, if you would be able to go and talk to these people, I, I'm sure all throughout history, I, I 
could practically guarantee you it hasn't changed. They would still tell you, the children of Israel still claim to believe in the Lord. And when they offer up sacrifices, what would they say? Oh, these are sacrifices are for the Lord. Even though they're practicing idolatry and their heart is completely removed from God, and they're not really worshiping the Lord, but they would say that they are. Just like when, I mean, when Aaron made the idols. These be thy gods, O Israel, that brought thee forth out of Egypt. So they're going to say, this is the Lord. But it's idolatry. That's not the Lord. That's not the right worship. That's not have anything to do with the right religion. But they'll say that it is. Just because people say that they're believing something doesn't mean they really are. That, that has been a key deception all throughout history. The Sadducees and the Pharisees were a prime example because they claimed, we believe in Moses. We, believe, we don't know about you, but we believe in Moses. Jesus said, look, if you believe Moses, you'd believe me because it's the same message. It's the same God. He's a prophet. They're both speaking by the Holy Ghost. The prophets, Moses, all were speaking under the power of the Holy Ghost, and so was Jesus Christ. No, no disconnect there whatsoever. The problem was is that they weren't of the Father, so they couldn't hear the Son because they didn't really believe Moses. They believed in a works-based salvation. They still believe in a works-based salvation. That hasn't changed. And uh, all they have is their man-made religion. Now, there's no new thing under the sun, and we have the exact same thing going on today. Except instead of Judaism being, you know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the, the old, you know, I don't, even call, I don't even call that Judaism. The Old Testament belief, that's not Judaism. I would, it, it's, it's, it's still Christianity. It's just pre-Christ Christianity. Right, right. If I'm going to call it anything. Right. Worship of the Lord. Amen. You know, wh whatever name you give it. I, I, it's not, it, because Judaism is just this total false religion. Yeah, right. But today we have, we have the same thing. Just like the Pharisees were apostate Jews. Right? They were, they were apostate worshipers of the Lord. They didn't, they didn't really do things the right way. They didn't get it. They weren't saved. I think the biggest example, the prime example we have of this today is the Roman Catholic Church. Roman Catholic Church. The apostate Christians. You ask them, do you believe Jesus? Oh, yeah. We believe the Bible. We believe Jesus. This is our religion. Jesus died on the cross. We believe in the Trinity. We believe all these things. But do they really? Do they really? Do they really believe the Bible? No. Why? They've elevated their tradition above the Word of God. Their tradition supersedes the Word of God and God's law and God's commandments. And that's how they get around the things they don't like in the Scripture, just like the Pharisees. They, they, they are like identical to the Pharisees in so many ways. Why do you think they have so much idolatry? Just like the Pharisees. What, what about the, you know, think about um, in the Old Testament, when they strayed away from the Lord, what were they doing? They were worshiping who? The Queen of Heaven. And they're giving their sacrifices and they're making their bread, making their bread to the Queen of Heaven. And what do you have going on in the Catholic Church? They've got their communion and their mediatrix. Mary, who they call the mother of God. And if Jesus is a king in the Catholic religion, then Mary's the queen. You want to talk about making the commandments of God of none effect within the Catholic Church? I listened to this video this week. I had somebody send me this video of this bishop, right, I'm going to put it in quotes because the guy's not a bishop. Catholic Church uses all, you know, try to use these, these terms, but the guy's probably a pedophile like, like the rest of the Catholic priests. But Bishop Robert Barron, here's what he said. And it was, he did this interview with, um, what's that Jew's name? Um, 
uh, why can I not remember his name now? The, 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 the conservative guy, the, um, Ben Shapiro, thank you. Ben Shapiro, right? So Ben Shapiro is talking to this guy, this bishop, and he's like, well, let's get some of these hard questions out of the way. He's like, I don't really care about this question, but you know, my, my listeners do, they want to ask this. And, he's, and he starts off, he's saying, you know, I'm a Jew and, and, and I see, you know, I'm trying to follow the commandments of God and not just the Ten Commandments, but like, you know, 407 commandments. I'm doing my best to do this. And he's just telling him, like, I'm believing in works. So, so in the Catholic view of, of salvation and, you know, am, am I just screwed? He's like, is, is, am I just... And of course, what's the bishop going to say? He's going to say, yep, nope, outside of Christ, there is no salvation. Is he going to say that? Of course not. Now, should he say that? Yeah, he should, because that would be the truth. Yeah, you tell someone the truth, you know, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. How about I give you some scripture on this and tell you that you're going to go to hell, Ben Shapiro, because you're believing in works to save you and you're not believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. But of course, that's not what he said. Oh, no, 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 no. He said that if you're following your conscience sincerely, you can be saved. I'm sorry, chapter and verse, please. Can you, can you show me anywhere where the Bible says, well, your conscience is going to determine whether or not you go to heaven or hell? Ridiculous. He, said, he went as far as to say this. He said, and, and, he's, and he's going back to the, uh, he said, the Vatican II. Now, I don't know everything that was taught at Vatican II. Don't know if this is true, but this is what he said. Okay, he, and I'll take his word for it because it wouldn't surprise me if they do say this or teach this. I've heard similar things out of other Catholics, so why not? Either way, this guy, Robert Barron, said, even an atheist of goodwill can be saved by following his conscience. Yeah, and they claim to believe the Bible. But he's quoting, notice, he's quoting Vatican II. What's that? Tradition of men. Instead of quoting the Word of God. Why? Because you're not going to find, follow your conscience and you're saved. Now, he continually went back to saying, well, the preferred method, the preferred is, is through, you know, God gave us his preferred way through Jesus Christ. And, and, and then he, he tries to back it in and say, well, they're still getting grace through Jesus Christ, coming from Jesus Christ, like this atheist that doesn't believe in Jesus Christ. He's still getting grace from Jesus Christ. You know, it's whether he realizes it or not doesn't matter. Jesus is still giving him the grace. Like, so he's still involved because they still need to try to tie it around to, well, it's still all funneled in through Jesus Christ. So basically, it just doesn't even matter what you believe. I mean, if you're going to say an atheist goes to heaven, well, as long as, long as he's just in good conscience. Ridiculous. This, this new age philosophy and way of thinking, it, it, you know, this would make it sound like then, well, why don't we just burn every Bible and nobody say anything about Jesus Christ, about the truth, about the Bible, because then everybody can claim ignorance, right? And then in good conscience, you could say, well, I didn't know, God, because that's what they're teaching. That's what he's saying, is that basically, in good conscience, everything that you've had in your life that's led you to this point would make you think that there's no God. So how can I judge and condemn somebody who, and it's the same thing, who hasn't been exposed to the God? Maybe they don't know about Jesus Christ. Well, let's just burn everything then so that nobody could know. Right. And then everybody would go to heaven. Right. Why didn't Jesus think about this? He didn't even have to go and die on the cross then, did he? Right. He could have just came and just wiped everything out and wiped out all knowledge and then everybody gets to go to heaven. I mean, the Bible says that the Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If God wants nobody to perish, then why didn't he just do that? Because you can't be saved that way. It's ridiculous. And I'm so sick of it. You know, the Catholic Church has so much influence 
in the world today. And people need, you know, it, it's time to, to start pressing some buttons there and, and waking people up to, to this apostasy and, and just wickedness. I mean, how wicked is that? They're just leading people to hell by the droves. And you know how they're doing it? It's because that's what people want to hear. That's why. I want to hear. It sounds so nice and loving that everybody can just go to heaven. If you're sincere. God knows your heart. You sincerely believe he doesn't exist. Therefore, okay, you're going to go to heaven. It doesn't matter that you give no recognition at all to what Jesus Christ did for you. You don't even have to acknowledge it. You don't have to believe it. As long as you're sincere, because that's what God cares about is sincerity. Do we see that ever in Scripture, that God cares about sincerity? Go all the way back to Cain and Abel. Does anyone doubt Cain's sincerity when he brought of the fruit of the ground as a sacrifice to God? I don't. I think he was sincere. I think he really wanted God to have that offering of his works of his own hands that he worked hard for. I think he wanted to be respected for that offering and that he was completely sincere in giving that to God. Because why else would he be upset if he wasn't sincere about it? If the whole thing was just a whatever joke anyways, then he wouldn't really get angry when it wasn't accepted, would he? He'd just be like, oh, whatever. But he did get angry. He was upset that God didn't accept it because he really cared. But did God accept it? No. Because that's not the way God works. Being sincerely wrong still makes you wrong. And that's why the Bible has an entire chapter in Leviticus chapter 4 based on sinning through ignorance. You know what? When someone sins through ignorance... Oh, well, there's just no punishment then. It's just, well, now you know better. No, no. There was a sacrifice that still needed to be made. When you found out you're sinning through ignorance, you still sinned. Sin is still part of sinning through ignorance. There's no excuse. We're without excuse. Romans 1 says we're without excuse. His eternal power and Godhead, it's evident. You can look around. You can see nature. You can see creation and understand that God exists. No one's without excuse. And at the end of the day, anyways, God's the one who makes the rules. And God's the one who said, he's committed unto us the ministry of reconciliation, reconciling people unto God. Why would we have to if people are just can be saved by their conscience? It's because they can't. It's our job. So if people die and go to hell because they never heard of Jesus Christ, is that God's fault? No. Not at all. Is God to blame? Is God somehow unjust? And see, this is where it leads to people get people want to judge God. Instead of letting the Bible speak for itself and tell us who God is, people these days they want to judge God. And, and we see it all over. God is love. Love wins, and God is love. And, and God wouldn't ever do anything unloving. Well, why don't you read the Bible and just let the Bible tell you who God is, not whatever idol you want to make up in your mind and in your heart of who you think God is? Even, that, even the, what Jesus said about, you know, whosoever shall say to his, or uh, whosoever, he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. People today will be like, <gasps> what a horrible, wicked God that would do such a thing and would judge God instead of say, oh, that's who God is. Oh, that's how God feels about this. We have to come to God's word. It's truth. God is good. And you know who decides what's good? God does. We don't get to decide what's good and what's, what's bad. God tells us what's good and what's bad. Without God, we wouldn't know. Let's keep reading here in Matthew 15. Look at verse number 10. 
And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth the man. So now he's explaining why their stupid tradition is wrong anyways. He's saying they're all worried about washing your hands before you eat because they think that, oh man, if that dirt gets into your body, you're just going to con you know, contaminate and defile your body. Jesus is saying, that's not what it's all about. That's not what it's about at all. He's saying, what comes out of your mouth, that's going to defile you. Not what you're putting into your mouth. Not what you're eating. It's like that's, that's not what it is at all. He says, you know, basically, and, and he explains what it is here. And Jesus, when he completely rejects and refutes what the scribes and Pharisees are teaching with their tradition, this makes the Pharisees real angry, by the way. Look at verse number 12. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? Yeah, I bet they were. Because you just completely destroyed and, and, and contradicted everything that they just said. And that happens today. The Catholics that are going to listen to this sermon and listen to, to this preaching, uh, there's probably not very many of them, but any of them that might come across it and listen to this preaching, they're going to be offended. They're going to be upset by it. Just like the Pharisees were when Jesus just completely rebuked and destroyed their vain traditions of man that contradict God's law. Verse 13, But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. He's saying, basically, I don't care if they're offended. Because anyone who's of God, he says, uh, anyone who's not of God, any plant, any tree, right, not bringing forth good fruit, his father didn't plant those trees. They are of their father, the devil. Of course they're going to get offended. Of course they're going to get mad. And he says, you know what? They're going to end up being rooted up. So I don't care. Let them, let them be offended. They're going to be plucked up by the roots and cast into the everlasting fire. Let them alone. These are blind leaders of blind. Blind people, you know, if, if, you, if your leader is blind and all your followers are trusting on the leader, who knows where they're going to lead you? They're, they're both going to fall into the ditch. That's what he's saying. Verse number 15, Then answered Peter and said unto him, Declare unto us this parable. parable. And Jesus said, Are ye also yet without understanding? Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the draft? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. He's saying, whatever, you, you know, this physical stuff, you're putting food in your mouth and your hand's not clean. It's just going to go into your belly and it's going to come out in the end. Done. Doesn't matter, right? That's not going to make you unclean. It's going to pass right through you. But what's coming out of your heart, that's where sin lies. And that's what defiles you. Because your heart have the evil thoughts and the murders and all manner of sin is coming from within you. The lust of your flesh. And that's what makes, that's what makes you unclean. That's what makes you defiled. That's what you need to be focused on and worried about. Not what passes into your mouth as you're eating food. It's this focus on the physical that they were worried about instead of the spiritual, instead of the heart. And that's the way it was with everything. They're always focused on these outward appearances, making themselves look good, you know, tearing other people down on all the outward stuff. And they, and they omitted the weightier matters of, of judgment and the law and mercy, right? They, they didn't care about, uh, about the things that come from the heart. Let's keep reading here. And also, just one last point here too. Though notice how Jesus expounds to his disciples when they have questions. And I think that's great. Because even though he says to Peter, you know, like, are you still without understanding? Like, you're, you're not getting this? You're not picking up on this? And, you know, for as much as I would have loved to be around during the time of Jesus, I don't know how much I would have asked questions <laughs> because... <laughs> 
<laughs> because as I read the Bible, sometimes I'm thinking like, man, what does he mean by that? And then the disciples ask, and he's like, don't you know this? And I'm thinking like, I am, I am definitely no better than any of these guys at all because I have even more questions, you know? Like, <laughs> But he still answers them. Like, don't you know this, Peter? Come on. And then, and then he goes and just further explains, you know, into more detail what he's talking about. And, uh, and, and I think that's great. He, he wants to give wisdom to everyone that asks in faith. Now he spake to the multitudes in parables and in some darker sayings, but unto his disciples, unto those who, who were sincere in, faith, sincere in their faith. Right? There's a good sincerity to have. Sincere, sincere in their faith towards Christ. Not just sincere in, in whatever that faith is. Sincerely following and, and seeking the truth of God through faith in Jesus Christ. God will honor that. It's not all faith. It's faith in Him. Verse number 21, Matthew 15, verse 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed in the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coasts and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Now, I already brought up this point a little bit earlier, but I think this story is an excellent example of how we should let the Bible teach us and not impose our own view of how things should be on top of the story, right? And just, and just come up with our own understanding. And, and what I mean by that is that when you read this story, you could say, well, it doesn't really seem fair that just because this woman was of Canaan, that she would have to be dealt with differently, right? Why does she have to beg why does she have to go through all of this? When Jesus is walking around and just healing people and going all these times, why does she have to beg? So that doesn't sound fair to me. Right? And this is the person that comes, that approaches the Bible with a wrong attitude, with an attitude of judging God, judging Jesus, judging whether or not the one who tells us what's right is right himself, instead of letting the words of God teach you. I mean, you could see how you could easily just twist that. Right? And say, well, well, who does he think he is? What, why does she have to go through all this stuff? You know what? Maybe there's a good reason for that. In fact, there is a good reason for that. Instead of getting bitter and angry and saying, well, that just can't be, and then try to twist Scripture into making this say something other than it really is saying, because that's what, that's what these people who deny the Bible want to do anyways or try to do, and, and they're always doing that. Just like, you know, in, in today's culture, people want to embrace and, and accept sodomy, homosexuality, total perversion. They want to make, okay, so how do they do that? Well, they have to just completely misconstrue and twist and, and make the Bible just mean something that it doesn't say. And what it does say, it has to, they have to just make that mean something else. And it doesn't have to really completely make sense. They just have to say something to address the, what the Bible obviously says. So they come up with their weird ways of excusing things and saying, well, God is love. So if God's love, then of course you can't do, you know. We have clear scripture that says just completely, just, just like Jesus said, he that cursed the father or mother, you know, he, he, let him die the death. Like that's what the scripture says. But I guarantee the Pharisees had ways around that. Well, you see, it's, no, no, you can't explain those things away. And watch out for people that try to explain away Scripture. Yeah. Just take it for what it says. I think this is a great example uh, in order to, to receive healing. And, and look at how much she went through 
to, to get God to answer a prayer. I think we can look at this as something that we can uh, take note of and not be defeated easily. She ended up getting favor from Jesus Christ, even though he wasn't sent to anyone but the house of Israel. He was sent to do a specific job, and, that, and he was doing that job. But you see multiple times in Scripture, actually, people still receiving grace, even though he wasn't specifically sent to those people. And here, this woman of Canaan, she, says, she starts off by saying, have mercy on me. She's humble. Have mercy on me. And she's crying after the disciples. And that's why they're like, like, send her away. You know, she's crying after us. I mean, she's entreating them and just, just going after them, kind of being relentless. And then when it says she came and worshipped him, it means she came and she got down on her face, on her hands and knees before Jesus Christ. That's what it means to worship. It's not <laughs> praise and worship. Okay? Do a study on worshipping in the Bible. It's when you are getting down on your hands and your knees and humbling yourself before the Lord. That's worshiping. She came and she worshiped him, saying, Lord, help me. He, I mean, she, they're trying to, to send her away. Jesus isn't answering her, and she still keeps going back. And then he even says, hey, it's not meat. He's saying, it, it, you know, it's not right for me to take the children's bread and just cast it to the dogs. So what's he, he's calling her a dog. You may hear some things in the Bible that are going to sting. And you might feel like the Bible's calling, you know, God's Word is calling you a dog. Now, you can have one of two reactions. You, could, you can get angry. You can get upset. Be like, well, forget all you then. Forget that. Forget the Word of God. Forget church. Forget all this stuff. I tried to go after God and, and all I get is this, I'm a dog. Or you could humble yourself. Yeah, I am a sinner. Yeah, I've done wrong. But can you still show me a little mercy? That was the attitude that she had. She said, truth. Truth, Lord. I'm just a dirty dog. It's true. But the dogs eat the crumbs. Can I just get some crumbs, please? Please help my daughter. And Jesus showed mercy. And he gave the healing. Let's remember that story. Learn from that. And not, not get haughty and proud and lifted up and think, well, I did so much for you and I suck. No. The truth is, if we looked at ourselves, we're not all as great as we'd like to think we are. Let's seek mercy from Christ and from God. Let's do our best to go out there and, and, and live a righteous life. But at the end of the day, you know, we can't be upset over, over things that we don't receive that we think we should. But let's not give up either. Don't just give up on things. Keep seeking. Keep entreating. There's something in your life that you, don't, that you don't have. You've been praying for a little while. You've been asking. You've been begging. Don't give up. Don't give up. We have plenty of examples in Scripture. Even, you know, think of uh, Isaac. The Bible says he prayed for, for a child. Forty years go by. Before that, that prayer is answered, but it gets answered. Don't give up. And trust in God that, you know what, God's righteous. We're not. Truth, Lord. Stay humble. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 29. And Jesus departed from thence and came nigh unto the Sea of Galilee and went up into a mountain and sat down there. And great multitudes came unto him having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. Insomuch that the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to be whole, the lame to walk, and the blind to see, 
and they glorified the God of Israel. Jesus continues to heal. And, and here's another example, right? You, this woman, I mean, she has to really just, just humble herself, but all these other people, Jesus healing, 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 healing. But again, just magnifying who Jesus was, everything that he did. We can look at so many of these examples, and these are specific examples. You know, the, the Bible's historical. These, these are eyewitness accounts. Don't forget that. Like when you, when you read the Bible, the, the gospel according to St. Matthew, these are like the words that Matthew is using as a testimony of these things really happened. And then you got Mark, and you've got Luke, and you've got John. You've got four witnesses of events that happened, along with everybody else who's, who didn't write down, you know, everything that happened. It really isn't some unreasonable faith for us to have, even in 2019, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That is not unreasonable whatsoever. There are plenty of accounts here. And when we could look back, you say, yeah, but it was so long ago. How could we invalidate this? How about the fact that it's 2019? How about the fact that, that Jesus Christ did so much in this world that they decided to, hey, let's, let's create our, let's start time with the birth of Jesus Christ. Right. And we'll call it AD, the year of our Lord. 2019, the year of our Lord. Anno Domini. It's not after death. Look at the influence and the power and the people that have, that have been willing to be martyred. If it was all just a lie, why did they let themselves die and die in the fashion that they did? What gain would they have gotten from that? There is none. There's, there's so many reasons. And we keep reading in so many chapters just all the healing, all the good that he did. The reason why it's so wrong today, he had such that, that profound effect. It was, it was undeniable. Undeniable. Even the resurrection was undeniable. That's why they had to pay off the soldiers to try to, to lie about it and say, oh, well, they came and got his body. Because even they saw it and they knew it was true. They saw the angel roll the stone away. They saw, you know... Undeniable. And that's why in John it says, you know, if, if there were books written <laughs> on, on all the things that Christ did, that the world wouldn't be able to contain all of the books for all of the work that Jesus Christ did on this earth. That's a lot. And we read just verses and sentences. I mean, verses 30, just verse 30, lame, blind, dumb, maimed, many others, they're healed. Like one verse. Just all, these, just, one, just all these people healed. And that's happening over and over and over and over and over and over again. We're not reading about all the times that happened. This is just one, one example, one prime example among many. Jesus Christ proved undoubtedly that he's the Son of God. We just have to take it by faith. I don't think that's a very difficult faith to have. I mean, even just coming to that conclusion, it's, it's not that hard. And when you have the, the, the Word of God without contradiction, without error, you can test it, you can prove it, you can look to it. Very reasonable faith to have. Let's finish up this chapter, verse number 32. Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I will not send them away fasting, lest they faint in the way. And his disciples say unto him, When should we have so much bread in the wilderness as to fill so great a multitude? And Jesus saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? And they said, Seven, and a few little fishes. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and the fishes and gave thanks and brake them and gave to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. We're following the same exact pattern that we just saw last week with the 5,000, right? And he gave, you know, he blessed, he brake, gave to his disciples, his disciples gave to the multitude. I'm not going to re-preach all that, everything that we see here. And then, of course, everybody's satisfied and they have leftovers. They did all eat and were filled and they took up of the broken meat that was left seven baskets full. 
And they that did eat were four thousand men beside women and children. And he sent away the multitude and took ship and came in the coasts of Magdala. Now, notice here, it doesn't matter how much food they had to start with. Because in this case, they had a little bit more food than they had with the other people. And there were less people gathered here than previously. This is 4,000 people. They had 5,000 people there. They have five loaves here. We've got seven loaves and a few fit. You know, none of those things matter really at all. What matters is that whatever they had, Jesus blessed and made sure there's enough for everybody. And then even the amount of leftovers that, that came back, there's, the fact is that there, was, there was plenty of leftovers and plenty to go around, regardless of exactly how many came back. And what's interesting about this time, too, though, is that last time we saw the, the multitude gathered around, he got on a ship, he went into a mountain, and it was kind of like that day. He's, this time, these people continued with him three days. I mean, these people were hungry for the Word of God because they're just, they're listening to him preach and they're getting healed and, you know, all this stuff's going on. And he's like, and again, he shows compassion on the people. Say, hey, let's take care of them. You're going to come here. You're going to hear this preaching and everything else. Let's take care of their physical need. But this is all we have. That's fine. It's good enough. And it's enough to, to, to care for everybody. So I covered a lot of that uh, last week. I don't want to get into that anymore tonight. So let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the instruction that we receive from your word. Lord, I pray that you would please just help us to... Uh, be steadfast in our faith and unmovable. I pray that you would um, help us to expose the traditions of men that are being taught for doctrine and um, expose them for what they are. Lord, help us to remain pure in our faith and, and in our doctrines. I pray that you would please just uh, open up our eyes and give us more wisdom and understanding. And God, help us to endure and to... Um, Remain humble as, as we entreat you, and, and God, we ask for your mercy upon us. As in Jesus' name we pray, amen.